Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with photojournalist Natalie Baring. She's, uh, she's speaking from her home in Utah and uh, couldn't be happier, happier to have her. Hi, hi, Natalie. Hey, Ken. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you for uh, talking to me. It's, uh, it's always great to talk to you. What, uh, just so people know, give me a little bit about your history as, as a photojournalist. Well, um, fresh out of college in like 1995, I moved to China and I okay, studied there. Why'd you move to China? Um, I think I just wanted to have an adventure. I've always, my parents, um, are, my mother's an immigrant and um, my dad used to work for the State Department, so I kind of grew up traveling and in different places around the world, so I just sort of felt like I could, <laughs> and I wanted to learn a language in between going to grad school, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but um, I just found an ad in the back of Harper's Magazine, and it was for teaching English in China, so I did that for a year. I was the worst English teacher you've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen a teacher sleep on the desk? <laughs> it was pretty bad. But I did learn English grammar for the first time in my life um, as I taught it. But uh, yeah, and then I studied Chinese at a Chinese university. And um, when I finished, I took a big train trip through China by myself because I wanted to speak Chinese to regular people, I, I found that my the Chinese method of education is more kind of just memorization. So I didn't really have a practical grasp of spoken colloquial Chinese. So I did a big train trip and I perfected my Chinese and I took an old Nikon. I can't even remember the model now, but a really old camera that um, I salvaged from a, a boyfriend's dusty shelf and a light just went on. And when I started taking photos, I just, I was like a magpie. I was so greedy. I just wanted more and more and more. And, um, and I came back to Beijing and I developed all the film. And um, my boyfriend worked at CNN at the time and he said, you know, these are really good. You should go to, you should go to um, AP or AFP and see if you can sell them because you get $50 a photo. So I called AP and they weren't there and I called AFP and they weren't there. So I called Reuters and uh, Will Burgess, the bureau chief was there and um, I went down and saw him and sold him a few photos and he gave me a job. Awesome. So you didn't, you, you weren't a photographer or you didn't study photography in college. You, you were, you were going there for an adventure, not necessarily to be a photographer. He, yeah, and he didn't hire me because I was a great photographer. He hired me because I spoke Chinese. And, um, and he needed someone who could look at the newspapers for him and help him find stories and um, just, and someone eager. I was very eager. And he basically is one of the people who taught me everything I know. How, how old were you at that point? I think I was 22. I was 22, yeah. So that's a great age to, to get, uh, to get inst started. Um, so tell me, you know, people that go to photography school, go to college for photography and journalism, do you think that's uh, an advantage or do you think uh, just being a student and, and learning, what, what'd you, what, what was your major and, and was that I, an advantage? Or? I, um, I didn't know that it was an advantage. I do think it is an advantage if you're in the United States. Um, I definitely, I mean, I studied, I have a degree in history, which is so vague. It's just, I was just curious and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But um, I, I definitely have found that after moving, I live, I moved back to the United States about eight years ago. So most of my adult life I did spend in China and in some other places as well. But moving back to the United States, I find that the network that I have here is really the network that I had in China. And it's quite thin, actually. And um, I, I just see my colleagues and with so many of them have gone to Eddie Adams or have done workshops that I'd never even heard of. And I just, 
would have to say that the networks that they have are way more robust than the one I have. So honestly, when you, when you, when you think of yourself as a photographer, um, do you think of, you think of yourself as maybe not being in the same group as the cool kids and it might force you or encourage you to work harder? I, yeah, I definitely don't feel like I'm in with the cool kids. Um, and also, I kind of feel like uh, sometimes I'm kind of disappointed that like maybe the, the most, ro I don't know, I don't want to use the word robust again, but just like the, the big adventure part of my career, it might, it might, it might be over. Maybe I've already had my big adventure and now I'm just going to be more um like settled in some little town in the united states it's just much different but remind me of the second part of your question well i, I know you i know you started in beijing and that's when you got started but as far as your adventure goes it wasn't just in china you lived in afghanistan as well yeah i was in afghanistan for a year and a half with my ex-husband and that I've, that's where i started being a freelancer so that's where that began and it was wonderful i loved it every day was every day talk about adventure every day something new and and beautiful like you can't you can't take a bad photo in afghanistan it's just it's so rich visually and just a wonderful place to be a photographer i don't think people quite quite realize you know they think of afghanistan is as kind of uh, a rough place. And I always think about Afghanistan as a, you know, a country, it's like, it's like a, a beehive. It's like beautiful to look at. And, and as long as you don't, don't bother the beehive, everybody's pretty happy to have you around. Is that, is that your experience or am I wrong? Oh, no, I would agree with that. But I would also say that being a woman in Afghanistan was a huge advantage. And um, I, would, I could photograph everything. Because people people would ask me if I was a man or a woman, they couldn't tell. Even when I was speaking, they couldn't tell. And I, I just to not draw attention to myself, I would always cover my hair and I wouldn't wear anything that wasn't long sleeves or long pants. But just the spectacle of seeing a woman marching around with a, a machine by herself or with a translator, I think it was very perplexing to people. And once they realized I was a woman, I was in maternity wards. I watched babies literally coming out of birth canals, taking photos of that and taking photos of Pashtu women in their homes. And I had remarkable access to women. And then I could also go into mosques and take pictures of activities that men did. So that would be, I would say, one of the first times in my career where I realized the advantage of being a woman it was just so great. That's an interesting point because. Um... I had that same experience. Uh, I had the opposite side of that experience in Afghanistan. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, not only was I never invited into a person's home, but I couldn't go into a person's home if the men weren't there, for example. I couldn't go and see what the women were up to. I, I'd just be standing outside on the street. Yeah, well, in my, in just a few years ago, I spent some time working for a charity in, in Portland and I did some photo editing for them. And then that's when I, kind of my idea of like where women should be photographing or where they have an advantage really solidified because there were so many photos where we would dispatch a man to go take photos of maybe some Muslim women in India or something like that and I could really see there was very little connection in the photos so it, it helps. right it reminds me of that piece our friend uh, Youngie did on, on the widow in, in Afghanistan. I mean, that's something a, uh, a man could never do. Yeah, well, women are less, less threatening, sorry to say. Like, I remember once being on a Greenpeace, like, uh, they have had these little speed boats, and I did a lot, a lot of work for Greenpeace in the early 2000s. And just, we were looking for, like, pirates, people who were stealing uh, first primary forest wood out of Borneo and we were running around in the ocean looking for these big shipping boats that were carrying the wood 
And we found one, and I remember the, the captain of the little boat said, turned around to me and said, will you sit on the front of the boat? Because they could just, if they see a woman there, you know, approaching them, that they would just, that it's just more disarming to see a smiling woman who's waving than a bunch of men coming up in a boat. Sure. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of an ongoing question, you know, uh, in some, in some, in some places, it's it's an advantage to be a man. In some place, in, in some cir- circumstances, it's an advantage to be a man, and sometimes it's an advantage to be a woman. But every photographer, every photojournalist, they have to figure out what their advantage is and then use it. And so, right. uh, if you've got that, you got to use it, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it all comes down to being nice to people and being charismatic and having people say yes to letting you in, into their lives. So I went, I, the same boyfriend who gave me my first camera once told me, whenever you don't know what to do, just smile and nod your head. <laughs> and I found that that was really good advice. Yeah, that's a great rule uh, to live by for a, for a photojournalist or a journalist of, of any kind, really. Yeah. The... Uh, the idea, oh, so, so how long were you in China? I lived in China twice, once from 1994 until 2000, and then the second time from 2002 to 2009. Nice. Yeah, so, I don't know. So your Mandarin's pretty good, right? It has been good, but always beware of someone who says they speak Chinese well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, um, it's been good in the past, and I think it's in there, but um, it's not as it's not as sharp as it once was. So, besides teaching, tell me tell me uh, how you how you patched a, a living together in China as a well, photographer. It was pretty easy because at the time, I mean, China was still you know way more of a developing country than it is today. I mean, it's like a Blade Runner set now, but in those days it was dusty and there were still horse-drawn carts. And that's, you know, I saw that often, you know, very kind of rural life in an urban setting. So life was cheap and um, it was good because I think Reuters paid me $500 a month for the first year that I worked there. Um, But I could live off of it and I got some raises and then I got some freelance jobs as well. And um, I would actually say that like living abroad has been a really good economic decision for me because I didn't have a lot of the expenses that are like the, the lifestyle of a Western person. I kind of lived like an Asian person and, you know, I would go to cheapo restaurants and I didn't want things. I didn't want like a new car or a new iPhone. I just, and I never bought anything that I couldn't afford. My, my life was just really kind of simple and just revolved around taking photos and hanging out with journalists. It was a really insular, small expat community. So tell me, the, the, so that first year, say that first year you're working with Reuters, mm-hmm. um, and you sold a couple pictures, you licensed a couple images, whatever, you know, how the wires work. And what was that evolution for you from being a complete novice to say a year later, what, 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 what were the changes in your workflow? How did you approach assignments? How did, how did, how did that evolve? Well, I think I, I was very, very keen and I would, the, the bread and butter out of China at that time was features. And I mean, you could, you could get a photo of a cute Chinese kid in the Herald Tribune. You couldn't get a picture of a cute American kid in the Herald Tribune. So it was really just, the point was going out every day and taking features. And if there was news, we would cover news. But I would get up at the, with the sun. I would get up at five o'clock or six o'clock. And I wasn't very good at shooting features at the beginning. It's hard. And 
I would just do it every day and I was relentless. I would walk and ride my bike and take the bus and walk and I just, I was like a, like a wild animal. I just really <laughs> was it stop. You couldn't stop me. I was, I loved it. I had a wonderful time and, and I had a wonderful boss too, who was very supportive and I would say that what changed from the beginning to the next year was just that I worked my ass off. And then I kept working my ass off because I loved it more and more and more. And I loved the journalism and I loved the photography. So that's interesting. You know, people always have this debate, especially in the, the street photography community, that, you know, street photography is, uh, is uh, different than photojournalism and this kind of stuff. And, and street photography kind of came out of photojournalism. I, I always say it's the exact opposite. I say street photography is the basis for everything we do. So you, you go out, you're curious, and you find pictures, and that leads to something else. And so really, just this idea of working hard and putting the miles in and shooting pictures every day, that's kind of the root of all types of photography, whatever your end goals are. Is that kind of what you discovered or? Yeah, exactly that. And I would say, I, I would, I would agree with you. That is for me, photojournalism is showing how people live in their quiet moments and in their moments of chaos. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference if it's a, if it's a funeral in Palestine or if it's a, someone eating rice on a corner in Wuhan. It's, it's just documenting life and what's true, documenting real, real life. Yeah, and they're all equally important. Mm -hmm. um, and the only difference is the photojournalism kind of has to have, you know, a peg, as we call it in the journalism business, something to hang on to, to get it printed. Whereas if you're a street photographer, if you're, you're working in, you know, Cartier-Bresson tradition, mm -hmm. you're just interested in seeing whatever you can see and then sharing that. Yeah, I would agree with that. So you, you work and it's, in- it's beautiful. What? And I, think, I think just also if it's that street photography, which actually I almost never use that phrase, street photography. I just think of it as features. But I think there's, an, you, it has to be, visually appealing it can't just have information it has to be beautiful and it's you have to make something out of nothing and you know if there's give me a bomb going off or a, you know like there's so many photos of people who take like people go take pictures of agent orange victims or something in vietnam that's that's easy that's easy you know making Taking a photo of something very simple and ordinary and making it beautiful is not always easy. That's such a, that's such a great point, Natalie, because um, this idea, you know, that, uh, you know, you can't, you can't communicate with somebody before they actually pay attention to you. And if you're always slamming them over the head with like, like you said, information, and there's nothing entertaining in there, even with hardcore photojournalism, you got to kind of invite the viewer in to start looking at your images before you can communicate anything that you witness. You got to, you got to get that connection first. Mm -hmm. Right. There has to be, there, there should be something. There should be something that makes something, makes your photo interesting. Right. I mean, that's the only way you can communicate. And then the other thing you kind of brought up was this idea and I, I've always told this to people, you know, conflict photography, whatever you want to call it, war photography. Once you've made the decision to go there, once you've made the decision to take those risks and make that commitment, the images, they're pretty, they're, they kind of make themselves at that point. It's, it's harder to make uh, images uh, at, in, just everyday life than it is actually war, war situations. Did you find that to be? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, having worked at a newspaper, having worked at the wires and then having worked nowhere, like when you're just doing it, when, 
when nothing is being paraded in front of you, you know, it's not like, here, shoot this. If you, if you just have to make it up yourself, that, that's a skill. That's a, that's a skill and not all photographers have it. And you can develop it or maybe you have it from the beginning, but that's a whole discipline, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think everybody has a certain photographic eye. You know, some are better, some, some aren't. And once they combine that with curiosity and hard work, then they have the, uh, the opportunity to move forward in their craft. Yeah, I agree. So tell me, you worked in you worked in Beijing for a long time. You made connections. You, uh, I mean, for a long time, it's like if there was a photo coming out of Beijing, it, it had your name on it. I mean, you were you were on the map at that point. Well, I was. I found myself in a really fortunate position too. Not really necessarily because of my photographic ability, which I which improved as time went by. But I was also, I had a journalistic accredit, accreditation. I, and I was a freelancer. Because I, I had a, it's called a ji zheng, a journalist uh, visa. So that's how I stayed in China. I was on like a work, a special work permit for journalists. But I was also, since it was, you know, I didn't get health insurance. They didn't pay for my apartment or anything like that. So I was a freelancer as well. So it was easier for news outlets to hire someone with a journalist accreditation. And it, it's dangerous in China to hire someone who doesn't have one. Like if you, if you just hire a freelancer who's there on a tourist visa and send him into the coronavirus zone, you know, the publication and the journalist could technically possibly find themselves in trouble. Yeah, as if being in the coronavirus zone wasn't trouble enough. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You'll probably be okay. Yeah. I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. But, so, but that was that was a great that was good that I had that extra credential that made me perhaps easier to hire than just some freelancers who were on tourist visas. I was very lucky. No, every every time I've gone there, it's always been, you know, oh I'm an artist and I'm on a tourist visa and you know, then you're trying to do journalism and it's, it, it, uh, it can be tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, uh, you worked in China, you worked in Afghanistan, you lived in China, lived in Afghanistan. Did you work in the Middle East as well? Am I right? Yeah, I did. Um, that was my, uh, second assignment with Reuters or my second posting. Uh, in 2000, I, my, I was relocated to Jerusalem and I worked with Jim Hollander in the Reuters Bureau there. And I was there for a year and a half. And then I got married. I met, I married the cameraman and in the Reuters Bureau. And then 9-11 happened and they asked him to go to Afghanistan and set up a bureau there and for, for television. And they didn't want to send me. So I quit my job and just went with them and started stringing for Getty. So that's kind of interesting, you know, this idea of setting up a bureau in Afghanistan that has no, you have no infrastructure there and you're the first person on the ground and your husband at the time was basically building everything from scratch. And mm -hmm. there's a couple movies out there, you kind of see uh, the lifestyle of the journalists and they're pretty kind of accurate really um this you have tell me about that that whole lifestyle uh living in a uh a complex i guess you'd call it but it's also your bureau and just tell me how that that works well again i was pretty lucky that i had a place to stay for free with my husband um it was definitely definitely pretty interesting i'm not a partier and i don't I don't drink or, I mean, I do drink, but I don't, when I'm working, I'm very serious. <laughs> and I was very early on, I mean, even before I got to Afghanistan, I already was in love with it. And I just, all I wanted to do was work. So I never, I didn't really participate in the parties scene. I know it existed for sure, but that was, 
definitely, I didn't, I didn't participate in that at all. A couple times I had some dinners on the top of the Mustafa Hotel with, uh, with some friends, but, um, but it was hard living in the house. We had a, a cook who was called Kaka, <laughs> which, is, which was um, pretty much what his food tasted like. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, it was, yeah, it was just a lot of men and not very much hot water. And um, I was pretty lonely. It was just, I didn't really, and besides my husband who was working all the time, it was, um, it was just me and sometimes him. And I hired a driver who was also sort of a bodyguard. And um, I would just wait for assignments to come in. And I, I, was, I had a little retainer with Getty. So I would do a few assignments for them a month. And then my driver and I would run around and, and just take photos of whatever they, they wanted or whatever other assignments I got. So the, the idea, so you're, you're in Afghanistan, there's not a bureau there. So you have to go in, you have to rent a house, you mm -hmm. have to hire security, you have to hire a cook, you have to hire drivers, you have to hire fixers, you have to hire translators. I mean, it's a whole, you have to set up your internet, you have to make sure yeah. you have a generator. I mean, everything is built from scratch. It is, and actually it's a, it was a great lesson for me to learn how to file in a pinch. You know, like if you, when I first got there, there was no, there were no cell phones. There was no internet at all. It was, I had a Thraya phone. In fact, my Thraya phone is, is faster than my internet in Utah. So, <laughs> but, um, and then I think Getty gave me an Imarsat after a while. And, um, yeah, it was, it was very hard, but. That's the price you pay for having a, just a beautiful, amazing adventure. So I was happy. I was I was happy every day to be working there. So just to just to recap, you started out as basically an English teacher in 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 Beijing, and by the end of this great adventure, you have uh, the kind of skills that most journalists uh, working in the United States. Will never have. I mean, you you could you could you could go in anywhere and and work. You're you're the full package as far as journalism goes. You can write, you can make the pictures, and you can get the I, pictures out. I love writing. I love writing. In fact, I've kind of taken a bit of a turn in the last year or so to do some more writing, and I've been seeking writing assignments. But yes, I feel like I can go anywhere and. I mean, I'm, I'm not afraid of traveling. I'm not, af I've gone to so many places and just on the plane, I thought, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> and then you land and you sit on this, I've, I've sat on the, on the end of so many hotel beds and just thought, how did I get myself into this? <laughs> but it's all, it's never hurt me taking a chance and just, Throwing caution to the wind and just going and doing something has never hurt me. It's not always been a success, but I've always won something from it. But I would say that that might not be a skill that is really useful in this environment now. Because no one, how many people get sent to the Congo from Portland, Oregon? Or you know, it's just, I, didn't, I would say that that would be where, going back to your first question, that would be where I have a bit of a gap because I don't really, and I'm terrible at marketing myself. So I don't have a very robust network of people. I don't know that many people. I'm not super aggressive about asking for work or seeking it, but, but I can't go anywhere in a moment's notice and make it work. That's, I mean, we've all been, we've, <laughs> We've all sat on the end of that hotel bed and said, said to ourselves, what, what have I done? Why am I here? And for me, it's don't you agree? sorry to interrupt you, but don't you agree that it's always good in the end? Yeah, it always works out good. But the, but what I'm saying is the way you tackle that. And I'm just saying this just because people watch this, they, they listen to people like you so they can, you know, have some of this knowledge 
the way you do that is you it's it's just a it's just a series of baby steps it's like okay i'm on the plane i got my plane ticket i got my visa now i found a hotel that i can afford and i can work out of tomorrow i'm going to get up and i'm going to start searching for a driver um and i'm going to learn my neighborhood this that just baby steps and then i'm going to go to you know the the bureau whatever that bureau is for foreign journalists i'm going to make my face seen there and i'm going to make some contacts and you just do these baby steps and by the end of the week you are kind of comfortable you are kind of you got your feet under you right i yeah that's exactly how it is and the more you do it the easier it gets Right, because it's the same. It's the same recipe wherever you go. The first day you're kind of like in over your head, um, but by the end of the week, you kind of not only do you know the city, you know the country a little bit, but you also know like the best restaurants to go to. Yeah, <laughs> where you could get a coffee that isn't a Nescafe. <laughs> right, <laughs> people don't know that Nescafe. It's like with all the gourmet coffee in the world today that we experience in the United States, Nescafe still accounts for like 70% of the coffee drink in the world. Wow. I mean, crazy, right? It, well, it is. I mean, I've had, I, I eat, I still, whenever I move or when I go through boxes looking for stuff, I still find Nescafes in old boxes, like 10 year old Nescafes that are at the bottom of like old camera bags or something like that. And that's all there good. is. They're still good. It's a, it's, <laughs> sometimes out, out of the blue, I could make a good cup of coffee, but I'll make a Nescafe just sitting at home. Memory lane. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you have when you're when you're driving, you have a driver, and you're going from say uh, Jordan to to Baghdad, and he's going about 120 miles an hour down the road. And he's making Nescafe and, and, and serving you coffee in the, you know, as he's driving and you're sitting in the back seat. That's really the best way to experience it. <laughs> I agree. I haven't done that road, but other roads. You, you, we've all been on that road, whether you've been yeah. on that road. <laughs> Tell me, um, so as far as, there's something you're hitting at here, and I think it's an important thing that uh, that every journalist needs. And you're really making um, it's not about making sensational pictures. It's more about making sensitive pictures. It's more about uh, tying into that empathy for your fellow human. Is that true? truer than anything. I mean, if you want to, <laughs> yeah, I think if you are going to take a photo of anything, you, you should have empathy for your subjects or at least try. And it makes your image true. It makes it real. I don't, I don't know if that's the right word, but if the whole point is to document, you have to show the truth well there's you know it's the difference between having an information photo we talked about that and a photo that that you know hits home with the viewer and we both know we know we, we you can see photographers who are very robotic and they make images that end up on the front pages of newspapers but there's no deeper connection there there that secret sauce is missing mm -hmm. and there's something that uh, comes through in the in the final image where you can see where the photographer's heart was or where their mindset was and I think that's the difference between you know that's when you you get to the chance to make a great image as opposed to just a good image I agree and I would add that my best images, I think, are from when I was, happy is not the right word, but when, when I could make a connection and when I was 
really, when I was in my element, like when, when I sh shoot what you love, shoot what you love. And I think it, that sounds corny, but it, it really is true. Like if the things that I care about the most, the issues I care about the most have made the best photos for me because I can connect to them. Like if you're going to send me out to take a picture of a football game, I'm not going to come back with a good photo because I don't even understand what's going on. You can, you can, I can't tell you how many times the rules of football have been explained to me, but I can't remember from, I can't remember them for five minutes because I don't care about football, but I do care about maternity wards in Afghanistan. I'm deeply, deeply concerned about issues surrounding women and women's rights or a lot of other social issues. I once did a photo essay about my father. Like those are my, when I look at my photos, those are the ones I love because I connected and I cared deeply. But it's no accident that the, that the photos uh, that connect with you also connect with others and the photos that you love also turn out to be the ones that are most impactful on the viewer. Well, that makes a photo valuable. The connection, you can see it in anyone's photos. If, if they have a connection, it, it comes through. I can't say there's a recipe for it, but I, I believe that, yeah, that's the, what do they call that, the defining moment? Well, it's, it's, it's a defining moment, but ironically enough, it's kind of hard to define what that it really is. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is that, an oxymoron? Yeah. But it, yeah, it, I feel strongly that the so, connection in a photo is, is what really, it's magical. I mean, isn't that the goal? I mean, you got this camera. It's not just, uh, it's not just there to, you know, we, there's robots, there's, there's security cameras out there that can take pictures of every, drones. But if there's not a person behind the camera, it doesn't, uh, it just doesn't work. It doesn't. I, yeah, 100%. But speaking of drones, I started flying a drone. Have you tried it? No, I'm, I refuse. <laughs> why i you know it's just uh i i prefer horses <laughs> <laughs> well fair enough but it is i got a drone about a year ago and i kind of had it in a box for the first six months i was afraid to fly it because i didn't know how and um little by little i just kind of got it out of the box and turned it on and made it fly just a little bit and more and more. And, um, and now I can fly. I don't have a pilot's license, but I am studying for it. And um, I love it. It's amazing to see the world from a perspective that you don't get to see it at. It's really cool. Well, you know, just to be honest, I did, I did take my, my nephew got a drone for Christmas and I immediately took it outside and started flying it and it ended up on the neighbor's roof. So <laughs> that could happen. It's like an expensive Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an expensive Frisbee. Yeah. So what, sorry, uh, I digress. No, that's what this is. This is, you know, when we digress, that's when we like actually might get to the, the heart of, of things. Um, Tell me, you know, what are your feelings on the, the current state of the industry? What, 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 is, what are you seeing out there? Well, um, I'm temporarily living in Utah. I'm not going to stay here forever, but there are some projects I'm working on here that I'm going to see to completion. And I'm pretty mortified at the – I thought Portland was bad, but uh, I've been offered – $40 for newspaper assignments here. And um, it's been, I don't know, I just, right when you think, okay, it can't get, it can't get worse. It get, it does get worse. I'm, I'm really, I'm really sad about that. Obviously we all are. And I'm a laid off photographer. So I'm speaking to you from, you know, as a, that point of view as well. Um, I, as an older person, I'm 48. Well, I'm not 48 yet, but I'm almost 48. I wish 
that I was more adaptable at social marketing, what do you call that? Like the social, what do you call that? I forgot. <laughs> social media? Yeah, social media. I just, um, I'm, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not very good at like, I feel weird taking a selfie and I feel weird acting like a selfie person. Do you know what I mean? Just like, look at me. I just don't, it doesn't come naturally to me. And I think that asking for attention is the way the industry works now, rather than just getting attention for your good work. And I'm sad about that. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of a cult of personality at this point, and uh, I'm not very good at that either. It's it's a little it's a little it's it's sad because it's almost um, it's almost the worst parts of television journalism that have seeped into the still photography world. You know, it's. Uh, I want, I want to say, you know, it's like, it's what people don't get is that uh, the story is not about you. It's about who's, whoever's in front of your camera, not who's behind it. And I, and I don't get that, this fascination with the selfies and, oh, look at me, I'm uh, uh, hashtag blessed, I'm flying on Air Force One. What is up with that? Oh, yeah, I don't know. But just that whole, that whole mentality, I think that, yeah, I think that we, I think Youngie spoke about this when she spoke with you as well. And yeah, I, that would be for me, like, definitely what I think about when I think about photojournalism and the industry and how it's changed, that it's not I mean, of course, there are wonderful photographers who are very young and they're making amazing work and have incredible perspective and they're super talented. But just to have to have your photo be amazing and therefore if people seek you out, I don't know if that happens. Anymore. I don't know if people see amazing photos anymore. It's not it's not the way that it was when when we were starting out like in the nineties or in the early two thousands, it's just less merit based and a lot of personality and connections are, I think that's really important. And also I would say, I love working with somebody who's easy to work with. You know, I love working with nice people and I hope people hire me because I'm nice to work with as well. That really matters that, I mean, but the talent matters too. Well, you're 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 a far cry from that, uh, you know, entitled artist. You're very you're self-deprecating. You're very humble, and I think uh, you know when you talk about Youngie, she's the same way. She doesn't uh, toot her own horn, um, and I think it's that not an act. it's not an act. I like wake up every morning and think. I'm a loser. <laughs> not every morning, but I have good days, but at, sometimes I'm just like, I'm actually not good at this. This thing I thought that I was good at, I'm actually not good at this. I mean, I have a lot of days like that and I have other days too, but it's not, I'm not really being self-deprecating. It's genuine. I mean, I'm, I'm, I struggle to find my own value as a photojournalist. Because I'm not, I don't feel like I'm very successful, especially now. I mean, I'm very, I don't get very good assignments. I don't know if anyone does. I mean, some people do, obviously, but not me. So just, you know, what I do when I, when I wake up in the morning and I feel like um, a little, little, uh, a little bit like, you know, a, a has been or a loser, I go out and I make a big steaming cup of Nescafe, and it seems to get me a little <laughs> uh, Well, I take my daughter for a walk. I've become a crazy dog lady, so. so That's good, yeah. too. That's, that works. Yeah. Dogs are good for that. Um, I don't think, 
you know, when you said, you said earlier, you said, you know, a person that says they're good at, at speaking Chinese, you have to be, you have to be cautious about that statement. And mm -hmm. I think the same thing is true with uh, photojournalism, uh, photography, or really any of the arts. Um, when people, when people, you know, think they're great, it's, uh, it's either that they don't know what great is or that they're not looking, you know, they're not very reflective of actually what they're doing. I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, yeah, I agree with that, but also just what you said earlier, it's kind of personality cultish. Maybe just thinking now of what you said, like our politics are a personality cult. And I think maybe that's just the trend of humans to sort of be cultish right now. Maybe it won't last, but just to imagine that something's good when it might not be that good. Just because a lot of people say it is good. Well, that, see, this is the thing. Everybody on social media, they're trying to, basically it's, it's, it's uh, they're trying to portray they've got this perfect thing going on. And we know that's not true, but they're, 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 they're broadcasting this, this, uh, this fallacy that everything's great in their lives and their worlds. And, uh, you know, their kids are, you know, a students and, and their spouses just got a raise and, and, you know, everybody's struggling. And if, if so if you're starting with that, with that misconception, if that's what you're building your whole personal brand on, then it's the, the foundation is crooked. And how can, how can you make, how can you make meaningful images when you're starting from a crooked foundation? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can. <laughs> All right, but do you ever see photos? I've seen these things. This is a little bit off, off topic, but maybe not. Um, like, maybe not so much on Instagram. I don't follow very many people on Instagram, mostly just people I know, and it's mostly pictures of, like, dogs. But when you see a big frame and it's maybe kind of a moody background, with a little tiny person in it, and they call it an intimate portrait. Anyway, I always, I, I notice that that's something I see a lot. I don't know. Somebody who's afraid to get up and get close to somebody else. That's what I see. Yeah, I, I, I reviewed somebody's work yesterday, and the portrait section were, were almost like, um, you know, a portrait is not, shooting a picture from across the room of somebody that you've never spoken to who just happens to be sitting in the same coffee shop. A portrait is a <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. I is. mean, that person's going to share with you, you're going to share with them, and you come up with this image that has a little bit of you and a little bit of them in it, and that's a portrait, right? It's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and that's, <laughs> that's what a lot of journalism is, you know, whatever whatever somebody's willing to share with you, that's what you're working with. And you're trying to, you know, always get a little bit more of that out of them. It's a collaboration. And that's a learned skill too. I think you learn how to talk to people and get them to relax and open up and be not on guard, let their guard down. You can learn how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you can. It's a, it's a learnable. Tell me, um, should we look at some of your work? Do you mind? Sure. Okay. Yeah, not at all. Let me uh, let me figure out how to do this because I always always screw it up. Hopefully, this will come up full screen on your screen. Can you see that? Yeah, I can. Whoops. Does that work? You yeah, see? it's working. So this is Afghanistan? This is the very first day of school for girls after that girls could go to school after the Taliban fell. Because little girls didn't go, or big girls, nobody went, no females went to school during the Taliban era. 
So she's, I think, must be learning numbers or an alphabet there. I don't, I can't read Arabic, so I don't know. It looks like alphabet to me. Yeah, okay, probably. Probably A. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I used, to, I used to know the Arabic alphabet, but I don't anymore. I don't remember. So, my but this, children do, but I don't. This is the inside of a building, but you wouldn't know it because it had been bombed, and um, it's also the outside. So this is kind of, uh, this photo, you know, whatever, it's taken 20 years ago, but it still has meaning to you. My, it's a personal photo. Yeah. This was one of the best days I had in Afghanistan. I took a whole bunch of photos. I loved that day. And this is the one I loved the most from that day. So yeah, it was a so, pleasure. Let me, so we, we've, talk, we've talked a little bit about, you know, being uncomfortable and using that and getting, you know, into the environment and everything. I find that photojournalists, that uh, they get into their comfort zone pretty quickly in a new, this is, this is really kind of almost an alien experience to you going to Afghanistan right after the Taliban left power. But you, I mean, it's obvious you were in your comfort zone the first day you went out and started shooting. Yeah, I was greedy. I just wanted photos. <laughs> everything. I wanted everything to be a photo. I saw photos all day long. Isn't that wonderful? It was. It was wonderful. I love that. Tell me about this. And th this is also in Afghanistan. This is just driving around with my driver. And this is just a feature. This is not, wasn't news. But we ended up at a raisin factory. I mean, well, a raisin depot, I guess. And right. one of, there aren't many things that, Afghanistan exports, but they export raisins. So, <laughs> so this, they're just moving around sacks of raisins and I just thought it was really beautiful. And I went in there and asked them if I could take photos and they thought I was completely strange and bizarre, but uh, they let me do it. Isn't that wonderful when, when people open up their lives to you and they don't really understand why they, that you're even interested, but they do anyways? It is. And I always tell people, just ignore me. Just ignore me. <laughs> and, and they did, these guys did a good job of just letting me take their photos, watch them work. That's wonderful. I mean, you know, it's like the, I always use the Marilyn Monroe line. It's like, we're just, we're getting by with the, with the, uh, through the, through the, uh, what is it? Oh, I've forgotten. Her. Through the, through the, just the, uh, the goodwill of, of strangers helping you out. Oh yeah. So this is, this is, uh, what year is this? This is. I want to say this is like 2003 or 2004, maybe 2005, it's early 2000s. I shot this um, on commission for Greenpeace. And this was the very, very beginning before anyone heard of E-Trash. I think, I think Greenpeace was the first one of the first to bring it up. And this is, I think, probably one of the first images of e-trash. And they, I mean, there are several places in the world where, e, where electronic trash is um, processed. Um, and this is in Southern China as one of, it's one of the, the hubs. first places people heard of. Yeah. So we went down there and it became a story that was almost impossible to cover in the years after this because they it's it's an ugly story i mean look at there's a baby sorting cables yeah um, they, they clamped down on this pretty quick but you were you were in there before they could before they could clamp down and just to put this in perspective you know beijing uh singapore i mean these places are sorry not, not saying shanghai these these are like you said these are like uh you know, Blade Runner cities at this point, but there's still these places in China that is kind of uh, the the ugly side of that futuristic yeah. world. Talk about income gap. Yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah, and this is still going on in China, and also ship breaking is going on in China, which is also very dirty and 
No, it's, yeah. it's so toxic. It's so mm -hmm. toxic. And, um, and this child, you said like, yeah, this is a baby on the ground, you know, <laughs> and that little pink apron just like almost breaks my heart. Yeah, and her little black hands. And, yeah. and she's not going to school. No. They're migrant workers. So um, in this, this system in China, it often prevents migrant workers, children from going to school, it makes it, it's an obstacle to be a migrant worker. No, they and they don't have the proper papers, so they can't even they can't even migrate to a different part of China. No. Where are we at? This is this is from a project. This is a portrait from a project. One of my first projects that I assigned myself, um, and I did. I wanted to do a story about China's aging population. And one of the places I did that was at a nursing home in the outskirts of Beijing that I just came across one day when I was feature hunting, just looking for features out in the countryside. Because the countryside is like, in China, is a wonderful place to take beautiful photos. But um, I met a man who was in China kind of unusual. He was a Christian guy who, was, who started a nursing home. Um, and he invited me to come in and I came in and I just talked to him and made friends and then I asked him if I could come back and take photos of people and he said if they didn't mind, he didn't mind. So he let me just have complete free reign in his little hospital or little nursing home. And this is, I think this woman was like 103 or something like that. And I don't remember exactly, but one of the portraits from that series. It's a beautiful portrait, Natalie. And the Thank you. thing that strikes me is once again, you're just out there. I mean, I always, you know, talk about, you know, you need a, you need empathy and a good pair of shoes and you're, you're, you're burning up the sidewalks. You're just going out and discovering things. And that's the, the curiosity side of it. So it's like you're working as hard as you can, but you're also working pretty smart to, uh, you know, you can't come up with these stories uh, by sitting at a desk and doing a Google search. You got to no. find No, you got to get out there and do stuff. And also, just personal work, I think, is just so important. Like, it's, it's not easy, and sometimes it's easier to, like, stay home and look at your phone or read a book or it, but I, just like what we were talking about earlier, when you take a risk and go and sit on the end of a hotel bed and think, what am I going to do? It's the same with personal work. Just, I, there's no, you can't lose. You cannot lose. It's, you always win. It reminds me of uh, a story that David Burnett tells about arriving in Vietnam and he's, he's walking around, you know, Saigon and he's trying to like, figure out what story to do. And Philip Jones Griffith tells him, don't, don't sit around Saigon and figure out a story. Go out, and, go out in the world and find it. It'll, it'll find you. I mean, that's what happens. You just got to get out there. Yeah. Well, you can't take a photo from your desk. There you go. Unless you're in Magnum. If you're in Magnum, you take three or four photos in your hotel room before you even leave in the morning. I uh, like the moody through the curtains. Exactly. You got the great <laughs> shot, you got the big mirror shot, and then you got like CNNs on, on the TV kind of grainy, you know, because it's an old TV. Or rumpled, rumpled sheets. <laughs> the, the rumpled sheets. I think that's actually a hashtag. Rumpled sheets. <laughs> um, I love this photo. This is just, I, I don't know if it's ever been published maybe once, but I just, this is the photo I want to take every day. It's a, just a woman, she's a migrant worker. This was in Shanghai. And she's just selling, I think they're just different seeds. And if you, you know, you've been to China, you know, it's, you, you eat seeds. You eat pumpkin seeds, watermelon seeds, uh, sunflower seeds, every kind of seed is edible. And um, the little boy just kind of hiding away, waiting for her to finish work. On their he's little part. Pumpkin. He's got his pumpkin seeds. Yeah, he's eating seeds too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was just a good moment. And I think I shot this with a, um, my 24 1.4. And I'm just 
really lucky that it was sharp. You were shooting Canon? Yeah. Yeah, that was a hard lens to get sharp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the bokeh is beautiful. I yeah, just luck. <laughs> And this is also from a series that I assigned myself. I just did portraits in Shanghai. And I, it might be on my website, but I sometimes take it off my website. I just rotate through different assignments or different collections. But I just spent a couple of weeks traipsing around Shanghai taking portraits of people. And these are just two old guys on their two bikes with their trash bags or their plastic bags over their seats. Two old friends. So, I mean, what, what, what's a better way to spend your life than walking around making pictures of people and, 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 and making friends? Is there, is there any, is there a better way to bring, I mean, it's the best, it's the best time I've ever had in my life. And also people always were nice to me and I was nice to them. And it was just, you know, you, it was just a really positive transaction almost every time. And if you're, a white girl going around China speaking Chinese, people are curious about you and they can talk to you. You know, like today, probably a lot of young people speak English, but back then, not many, it was hard to communicate if you were a foreigner, if you didn't have a translator. And then I just pitched up this kind of alien with a camera and started talking to people. And I just, I had the best experiences of my life of just the sweetness of strangers. I'm, I mean, I would get on a the train. Kindness, the kindness of strangers. That's the Maryland oh. one. Yeah, it's true. It's just, you know, if you, if you set up an environment for someone to be nice to you, they will be. And I, I can't tell you how many times someone has looked at me with suspicion, like, what are you doing? And then you just smile and bob your head, and just their suspicion just fades away. You know, if they see that you want to be friendly, you can do whatever you want. You can you can have a conversation. You can take their photo if you you know probably. <laughs> no, it's 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 an amazing thing. People don't realize that. Uh, you know, I would go out. I'd go out every morning and at, at daybreak in 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 Kabul, and just making pictures. And you you'd run into somebody on the street. You'd run into a guy, and he'd have that look on his face, like. Is there going to be trouble here? And then you smile, and then he smiles, and it's like everything's everything's hunky dory. And and this is a country that's been at war for whatever thirty, maybe forty years. And mm -hmm. to have that, just to have that exchange that you know we're both okay. It's kind of a beautiful thing. It is. And this is on that train to from Beijing to Tibet. It's the very first train. Oh, oh yeah. Or maybe maybe not the very first one, but one of the first train rides from um, from Beijing to Tibet. And you have I to think, wear the oxygen mask at some point on this train. I I did it, but it was an option. I didn't I didn't need it, but I did get some headaches in Tibet. But um, I didn't need it on this trip. But I just think it's kind of cute, that little guy peeking around. A little quiet cute. moment. It is cute. But it's, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful human moment. And light's gorgeous, so that always helps. Natalie, we were sitting right next to each other. I didn't even see you here. Oh, really? Do you have the same photo? <laughs> a little bit different? <laughs> Slightly different. You're like... Uh, let me see. You must be to the right of me. I was uh, kind of at the finish line. Were you to the right of the finish line? I don't remember. Maybe. Yeah, I think so. On the on the ground level, pool level, not ground level, water Pre level. Yeah, I may have been like one row up or something like that. Yeah. No, I was one row up too. I think you were... Oh, maybe we sat next to each other. We could have. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew you before that, but I didn't see you. I'm like, you know, I'm just looking through that long tube and that like absorbs yeah. the whole world when you're when well, you're shooting, sports. Yeah, shooting swimming is so hard. You don't really have time. 
I don't know. I found it really difficult. So it is difficult. And the swimmers, the swimmers are just, you know, they're not handsome people. They're just not good to look at. <laughs> you know, I mean, these people are like, they're like, they could be in fashion magazines, every one of them. It's crazy. Oh, this is nice. Um, Once again, you got a good light. Is it is it sharp on your side? It's not sharp on my side. Okay, because it's not sharp on my side either. Anyway, maybe it's a small file. The original is sharp. <laughs> I, um, I know it is. I, I don't worry. I want um, to tell once this gets compressed on YouTube. Um, this is just wandering around Xi'an, um, and uh, a picture of a guy making noodles. <laughs> the little chef. That's beautiful. You have this, it's a beautiful moment, but you have this, uh, you have this kindness to your portraits. And this is, I, I would almost consider this a portrait because he knows you're there and he, he's cool with it. Yeah, I think, yeah, he knew, yeah, it was, I didn't realize it at the time and I didn't realize it for years after I took this photo and just going through my archive one day, I picked it up and I was like, oh, I like that. <laughs> Isn't that so a good I had, thing about the archives, about the old old frames, the discovery, you know. I you know I think that might not be the right frame. That I have a I have a sharp one. I think that might not be totally sharp. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. It's still beautiful. There's Kobe. Yeah, because when I moved to United States, I. I mean, ha after having worked at the wires and doing journalism for so long, um, when I was at the Olympics, I started shooting portraits for an advertising agency called White and Kennedy, which I'd never heard of before. Um, just an advertising agency. And it's, kind, it's kind of a big agency. Yeah, I guess it is. I don't know. No, it, it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> it's it all Nike work. They, well, that's how I, and then I got connected to Nike, and I didn't, I just really got along well with the Nike guys who were there working with Wyden and Kennedy and doing like the art directing or being the client or whatever. And then Nike asked me after the Olympics if I would come to the United States and work for them on contract. So that's why I left China. Um, they made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. And, um, and I've never been treated so nicely in my life. Like I stayed in the best hotels all over the world. I flew business class. I mean, when I remember, I remember like sharing hotels with men I didn't know when I was, when I was, you know, doing journalism in like China or other places. And um, just because people were on such tight budgets. So it was really nice to do some, to learn how the other half lives and do corporate photography for a while. So I just, I just want to reiterate. Okay. So you've, You've had an amazing career as a journalist, but uh, then to, to make that leap to shoot for Nike with Wyden, and, Wyden and, and Kennedy, you know, that's kind of people like cut off toes, cut off feet for that would opportunity, young photographers. I mean, that's a big deal. Well, I was just in the right place at the right time. And I spoke Chinese. I spoke Chinese, Whatever. so that made it, I was there. Is that what you tell yourself when you're drinking your Nescafe? <laughs> I mean, there is a huge advantage. I mean, it's, I was there. I got up, I went to the other side of the world, I learned a language, I was there. I made, my, I availed my, made myself available to the opportunity. There was no one else, you know, and they needed a photographer, so I, got, I feel like I got extra opportunities because I was there. You know, this is an ad campaign that they could fly somebody in from New York or London or Paris or wherever they want. I'm just saying. Yeah, well, they did fly me. They did fly me in from New York. <laughs> you proved my point. And this is a story I did about my dad. I think I mentioned earlier, and um, I just think this is a really funny photo. Um, he, he makes a migration every year from his house in uh, Arizona to his 
true home in um, near Jackson Hole in Wyoming. So I was driving him because he's he's in his 90s and he still drives, but he's not good at it according to me. So I try I try to drive him, keep him alive a bit longer, and other people as well. So. This is us at McDonald's, and we just had an argument about eating at McDonald's. I was going to say, I was going to make some comment about McDonald's. You yeah, I wanted, <laughs> I, I wanted a burrito. I'm like, let's go somewhere local. Let's get a burrito. Like, I want to give my money to people, not a corporation. And he insisted that we go to McDonald's. Is this in Jackson proper? No. Oh, it, no, he lives on the other side of the mountain. He lives in, in the Idaho side in Teton Valley. He lives on the working class side. That's where everybody who works in Jackson lives. It is, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's why they have a it, McDonald's there. Well, this is actually in um, uh, someplace in Arizona. This is on our way. I can't, oh. it's like, a, it's maybe 100 miles or 200 miles out of Phoenix, right before you get into Nevada. Yeah. yeah. But they've got McDonald's there, too. He'll probably go there. <laughs> I love it. I want to know why the horses aren't wearing eye protection. Maybe they weren't looking. They didn't care about the eclipse that much. <laughs> Animal cruelty. It's Idaho. They don't care. <laughs> well, nobody wants a blind horse. No. Um, but, yeah, this was taken um, in Manan, Idaho, at the top of an old volcano crater have you been there do you know that place is that like the moon crater area yeah that's called yeah it's I've, around there. i'm like you, i'm like you sister i've been everywhere <laughs> anyway so it's just kind of cute kind of cowboyish i'm into the cowboy thing now that i live in the west i'm into cowboys give me a rodeo and i'll give you a good photo you got to come up here to the road. You know, I do. For some reason, I shoot rodeos every summer, and I, it's like it's almost. I know why. I know why you shoot them because they're amazing. They, they are, are amazing. amazing. They are amazing. I yeah. love that. I love that. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's 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 a true blue collar sport. I mean. You see, you see guys at the rodeo who 10 years earlier you'd photograph as kids, you know, running around town. And now they're in the rodeo and they're like traveling, whatever, 200 days a year. It's just, and it's just like an organic kind of natural, um, it's a cultural thing. It's, and, you know, everybody's equal at the rodeo. It's either you. Yeah. You get you, you get in you get into the to the money or you get into the dirt either way and that changes every day. It's it's a miracle. And it also yeah. happen at dusk, so the light is always the light. so beautiful <laughs> and You're dusty. Right. You're right. You got the dust and you got the good light and those two, and you got you got handsome people. So yeah, you got horses. So what you know? What more can you? Really it's perfect. This is frightening. What is this? It's a robot that delivers burritos. Speaking of burritos. <laughs> <laughs> There's your burrito. You don't have to go to McDonald's. Yeah, it's a, a, like a startup that's testing out a, a robot delivery system in Philomath, uh, Oregon. And I just think it's so funny. It is funny. And I love you have that little plastic child's car on the floor. <laughs> the prototype. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. And this is a more recent work. I shot this about a year ago of a, a woman who, um, it was an opioid story and she was having, losing access to uh, her uh, medication. She was pretty, pretty bummed about it. Yeah, that's rough. <laughs> What we've, what we've done in, with opioids in the last 10 years in this country is criminal. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like, it's like the crack, it's like crack opioids. It destroys, no, it destroys communities, kills people. 
I love this. This is so, this is such a unique photo because, you know, people that don't live in the West don't, don't realize that this is kind of, um, you usually, you usually don't see people roping calves in the, in a, in a huge field. It's usually, you know, in an enclosed area where they're just doing branding, but this is kind of old school ranching here. Well, this was taken, I took my, my, I have a border collie and this guy is a neighbor of ours, kind of, in Idaho. And um, he, he let, he said that I could bring my dog and see if he could, um, how yeah. he was, how he was a good cow dog or not. Yeah. So I just went out with this guy really as a field trip for my dog and I took my camera. And I, again, I didn't realize it at the time and then like almost a year later, I looked through these old discs and I was like, what? I did not know that these were so good. <laughs> but there's a whole series of them and I just, I didn't think about it and I ended up loving them. No, it's beautiful. It's, and, it, and, it, and it is. I mean, this is how um, when you're out in a field and by a field, I mean, it could be a section, it could be 640 acres, it could be a couple thousand acres. This is how you doctor animals. This is how you take care of them. It's, and the horse, you know, you talk about the dog being a partner in the whole process. The horse is a partner in this process too. They know what they're doing. They, they have a job and they, they do it. It's, it's, it's an amazing symbiotic uh, relationship. I love it. We're lucky we live in the West and we can see stuff like that and like this. Oh, we are. I love this. This is like, this is like a smaller hometown rodeo. It is. This is in St. Anthony, Idaho. And, are, you, are you in the arena or are you outside? I'm outside. I'm outside. I'm almost always outside. The only one I'm inside in is the Pendleton Roundup. They let you go in there. Right. But that is the biggest. Have you been there? It's gigantic. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's, a, it's a good one. It's a good one. And that the Pendleton Arena is huge. I mean, it must be like three football fields it's it's massive yeah it's it, it's if you don't know that it's going to be that big you're going to be disappointed if you don't bring really long lenses yeah yeah this is nice that's uh right there we're at the end okay natalie that was wonderful I'll, well thank you for talking to me and looking at all those photos Thank you for talking talking with me. I mean, uh, my pleasure. What uh, you got a new job? I understand. Yeah, I just started a part time job at a university in their marketing department, and um, it's uh, a lot of studio work. So they've got really huge brown color lights that are taller than me, and cranes and arms and gigantic equipment and I've never really worked with that stuff before. I mean, just very in a tertiary way. So it's, um, and I'm using it now. I'm like, I'm every day I'm taking photos with that stuff for every couple days. And, uh, it's wonderful to learn how to do it and just to see light in a different way and just be able to be so absolutely in control of the situation. It's difficult. It's difficult to go from, not wanting to control being a journalist to controlling everything so it's a i'm learning it's a new no, skill it's a, great, it's a great new skill to learn i mean that's yeah. exciting to be in like a real studio and just like create a picture from scratch almost yeah and since i didn't study photography i never learned how to do that so now i'm i'm learning and i've learned how to do a head the proper headshot too at 40. <laughs> It took me a while, but now I'm, I'm, that's part of this job, too. So we're doing headshots almost every day. And, I, um, I, I still can't do a proper headshot. That's, that's like my kryptonite, the studio portrait. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I, I think so many things in life, like the drone or going to a new place, it's just, it's just a simple puzzle, but it just looks difficult when you're passing by the first time. And once you do it, or once somebody really shows you how, or helps you, or you figure it out, it, demystifying things is so much easier than it looks like it will be. 
I love that. I love that attitude. Do you, uh, so speaking of learning, I mean, you were in China when you, and they, when you started like getting fascinated with photography, did you, did you ever get into photography books? Is, is there any that really struck you as something that uh, was maybe not life changing, but helped you along your way along the path? Well, I sometimes look at the books that I, the two books that I love and look at for inspiration are Bruce Davidson's subway photos and um, Luke Delahaye, uh, Winter Riser, Winter Riser, Winter Riser is from uh, Siberia. Trans-Siberia Trans Railway. Yeah, I, that just, I just, I'm endlessly fascinated by that book. Those are two good ones. So we'll recommend those at the, at the bottom of the podcast. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, Natalie. I sure appreciate it. And I, I, I sure appreciate your work and, and, oh. and how you shared, uh, you know, your, your, your innermost thoughts about the, the process and everything. Well, thank you for picking me. I hope, uh, I hope the editing process isn't too daunting. No, this is, a, this is good. Thank you, Natalie. Talk to you soon. Okay. All right. All right. See you at the rodeo. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Bye.